So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of make some um, disparate remarks uh, that might not add up to a, a single argument, but they might kind of uh, relate to various aspects of this topic. Um, so just while it's still fresh in the memory, let me make some comment on, on just the, uh, the, the previous argument um, on the inequality objection to uh, human enhancement, because it, uh, it's one that comes up often. Um, but it's always seemed to me important to distinguish uh, objections against one particular way of funding uh, human enhancement from uh, the general idea of human enhancement or the, uh, the availability of human enhancement technology. So if one were concerned with using up limited resources in the healthcare system, one could make human enhancement options available, but people would have to pay for them themselves. Um, that would be one way of circumventing uh, this, this, this kind of um, argument that there is this finite pie and that if we give some of it to people who are already healthy, that will mean less for those who are sick. Um, it might also be that there are certain kinds of enhancement that would be economically productive, that you could view them as investments rather than as consumption. Um, so if you have some enhancement that makes somebody more productive, say a cognitive enhancer, uh, that can be a profitable investment for society even to subsidize those things, for the same reason that we subsidize schooling, um, among other uh, things, because we think it makes for more productive labor force. So you can try to enhance cognitive performance through long years in school, or in the future perhaps also boost it by administering a pill that makes it easier to concentrate. Uh, or that uh, improves memory. Um, now, um, I think, I means so I've been involved in this for a while, and I, th there has been a shift, I think, um, in the general uh, discussion surrounding this issue. So back in the 90s, the most common reaction was, um, that this is just science fiction, it's kind of silly to think about it, uh, because it's not going to happen. Um, and over the past 15 years or so, I think, uh, the debate has shifted from could this possibly happen or not to should it happen or not. Um, and possibly in, in, in the last several years there has been a kind of further shift, not so much are you for or against human enhancement in general, but let's look at specific types of human enhancements in specific contexts and, and think about whether there are better or worse ways of developing this. Um, overall I think this is a very healthy development. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's pleasing to see that now there are like academic workshops and conferences uh, on, on biomedical human enhancements all the time and it's become adopted as a, as a major uh, topic in bioethics. Um, so I, I will, uh, mm, let's see, maybe come back just briefly at the end of my remarks to this, this broader picture. How many, um, how long should I be? No more than 15 minutes. Okay, and I've used up maybe five or so, so I Okay. Um, so, um, um, let me just um, pick up one other way of thinking <coughs> about some of these ethical issues that can apply fairly generally to a lot of different possible modes of enhancement. So that you, you can either analyze them by picking a specific enhancement with a particular pill and looking at the side effects and pros and cons and who will pay for it and, and look at all the details. But there are also some arguments that can apply more generally and, and, and help our reflection about the range of different possible enhancers. Um, so one of these is uh, the reversal test, um, which I'll explain. So the motivation for this is that cognitive psychologists have documented in a variety of settings that humans often exhibit uh, a status quo bias, which is defined as a, as a preference uh, for the status quo, or a judgment that the status quo is better, merely because it is the status quo, so a kind of irrational disposition to prefer the status quo. Uh, and there are many experiments that, 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 uh, that illustrate this. Um, for example, one, one study, you give a group of people who have filled in some form, like a little reward after, and randomly you assign half of them to get a, a nice chocolate bar, half of them get a, a coffee cup, uh, and then they're allowed to, to trade the gift they receive for the other gift. Um, statistically speaking, ex ante, you'd expect half of them to receive the non-preferred gift since they were handed out randomly. But in fact, almost everybody preferred to stick with the gift that they were given, 
it seems that as soon as something comes into your possession, you form some sort of bond to it. You begin to imagine how, how good this coffee mug would look at the shelf at home or how much you'll enjoy the, the chocolate bar. And, and, and then it becomes worth more. So it takes more for you to give up something than you would be willing to pay to get it in the first place. Um, and there are other studies that illustrate this effect perhaps uh, more stringently. Um, so there's some reason to suspect that these kinds of um, status quo biases might influence our judgments as well about what we think the overall consequences would be of introducing some kind of modification to human nature or some change in our capacities. So if we take the specific case of um, an imaginary drug that would be cheap and uh, medically safe, let's say, that, that enhanced average intelligence by a slight amount, a few IQ points, let's just consider this hypothetical. We can then ask the question, would it be on balance good or bad uh, for society, for people's welfare, if, if this uh, drug was made available? Um, now, um, some people will think it, it will be a bad thing to do this because you know maybe maybe people will get and then there are all kinds of reasons that are filled in into this lot. Maybe people will get bored more quickly if they are smarter. Um, maybe you will have these um, kids. Suppose it's it's like um, instead of a drug, maybe it's like a genetic enhancement, and you can only use it for kids. Maybe they will grow up in in families where the parents aren't as smart as the kids, and maybe that will create a mismatch. Uh, maybe people will just become more competitive because they're also smart and competing for the best jobs. So all these kind of reasons you could have. And you can think of many benefits as well. So how can you form any kind of judgment about the overall balance of this? And so here's where this reversal test can come in um, as a heuristic for how to begin to think about this, to remove possible status quo bias. So if somebody judges that it would be bad um, to increase average intelligence by a small amount, um, then you ask, what do you think of the proposal to uh, decrease average intelligence by the same small amount? So instead of adding three IQ points, let's consider the possibility of removing three IQ points. And they will then um, um, say that it would be a horrible thing. Like obviously, uh, it would be idiotic for us to pump lead into the tap water just to make us all dumber. Um, and then uh, the question is, if it's bad, if average intelligence increases by a little bit, and it's bad if it decreases a little bit, what reason should we have for assuming that we're currently sitting in this local optimum? Um, if you think of a generic curve, like there will be very few points on that curve that are local optima. For most points on the curve, it will be the case either that you make things better if you move a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right. Um, now, there are many parameters, of course, where we have reason to stick with what we have. You, you wouldn't want to, say, change the, the ratio uh, of, uh, like, like um, you know, that make your, your, say, hearts or lungs bigger, uh, nor would you want to make them smaller for the average person, because there's some reason to think that we have sort of the optimal uh, size of our internal organs relative to our body size. Evolution would have uh, tried to optimize the human organism so that all the parts fit together. Um, but for something like cognitive enhancement, it doesn't look like that kind of argument would apply. Uh, and for many reasons, um, there are <coughs> there are ways in which um, particular cognitive enhancements might be unavailable to evolution. Um, they, they just couldn't evolution couldn't have developed those kinds of changes. It might also be that we place a value on certain types of enhancement uh, other than the value that evolution places on things. Evolution only considers whether it increases uh, inclusive fitness, whereas we might be interested in whether it makes our lives go better. Um, there might be different trade-offs that evolution might have been constrained. Uh, it had to conserve calories in, in the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness. Uh, so maybe brain metabolism uh, consuming some uh, 20 watts uh, uh, is, is a major factor and anything that, that would have increased that even more by having bigger heads or more uh, active brains would, would have to, any benefit from that would have to be uh, weighed against the extra metabolic cost, but since we have plenty of calories, we might want to put that trade-off in a different place. Um, so, um, the general idea with the reversal test is to ask yourself this, this challenge question, then, that if you think that it would be bad to increase some parameter, uh, do you think it would be bad to 
decrease it? And if not, what justification do you have for, for suspecting that we are in a situation um, where, where neither direction would make things better? And, and in some cases, there is good justification for that, but in many cases, not. Um, um, so, um, let me leap back to uh, this um, earlier kind of narrative quest of where the debate has been going up until now and, and where I think it should, should move into the future. So, I'm more interested in the really long-term implications of um, technological development and, and human modification than, than the immediate applications. I think there is a tendency sometimes to hype what is possible right now or in the near future. Uh, and what works in the laboratory doesn't necessarily work when you roll it out into people that are hidden side effects and all that. But if one sort of zooms out and think that in the longer run, uh, whatever the side effects are right now, presumably will be overcome. And an increasingly more radical ways of modifying human nature will be developed over time if science and technology continues. It's then interesting to, to try to step back and think about the strategic question that, that we as a species confront. Uh, if we're going to develop all these powers, how should we go about it? One might think that there are certain powers that we should not develop um, because they're too dangerous. But even if one holds that view, one might still think despair of the possibility of, of relinquishing those developments given that we don't have um, a world government that can implement the decision globally, given that there are so strong incentives to move forward in different technology areas, um, profits, national competitiveness, etc. One might think that most useful technologies that could be developed will eventually be developed by somebody somewhere. And there's then a different set of questions that one might want to ask. We might be able to influence on the margin, say, the speed at which various technologies are developed. We might uh, influence the sequence in which new technological capabilities become available. Uh, we might have been some influence uh, over who develops it, which country, where they occur first, and the context, and how they are used. Um, so, when I think about which kinds of human enhancement I would like to see more research funding for, where I was sort of rooting and hoping for rapid progress, I'm thinking about it partly in terms of what would increase the overall chances for humanity to make it through this critical century and to secure a prosperous long-term future for itself. And there it seems to me that what we need urgently um, to help us deal with the whole plethora of other challenges that we confront is more uh, wisdom. We also need better coordination and more goodwill, but, um, but wisdom, the ability to understand the consequences of our actions. Uh, and there, that's distinct from, from cognition and intelligence, but it's not unrelated. Um, so among the different types of human enhancement, if we think enhancements of mood, enhancements of the body for sport, um, changes in personality and cognitive enhancement, I would be more worried about changes to uh, human personality, things that change our values, um, and think maybe we should go slow on that front. But more eager to hurry up and expedite as much as possible cognitive enhancements and in particular those types of increases in cognitive ability that could translate into sounder judgment uh, and a better ability to think clearly both about morality and about the long-term consequences of our actions. And to the extent that biomedical human enhancements can contribute to that, I think it would be extremely valuable and reduce existential risk, all things considered, and, and you know, increase chances of a good future for humanity. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there too. Well, thank you. Most people abuse the time, you've actually underused it, but thank you very much indeed. Um,